All right, hello everybody. Um, Alex Bucklehide. Um, I farm near Northville, South Dakota, which is about 25 miles south of here. Um, we're primarily corn and soybeans. Uh, we raised some wheat in the past and we're bringing oats and rye back into our uh, rotation for this year, along with some soil health and habitat program makers and, and CRP. Um, I'm the fourth generation to come back to the operation and I have the the privilege to farm with my wife and my parents and a great team on our farm and it's a lot of fun. Um, and recently my wife and I had our first child in October. So between balancing fatherhood and pursuing a career that I love, uh, life, is, life is pretty good and it's a fun challenge. So I'm really excited about us to come here. I'm Cooper Gordon and my wife and two daughters and I farm with my parents outside of Tulare. We run a cow-calf operation, row crops, and some small grains we're getting into. Um, we primarily calve in May and June, leave the calves on the cow until March, or we wean them off, and then we run them as yearlings or sell them then. And then the cows <coughs> will bale graze through the winter time when we run out of forage from fall grazing, and they'll get hauled out to pasture where they calve about the 10th of May and start the process over. This will be our third year going on no pesticides, insecticides, pour-ons on any of our pastures or our livestock. And uh, things have been going pretty good so far. My name is Sam Ireland and I'll have to take a little longer than these guys for my introduction. I gotta explain why they asked to have an unemployed guy up here on the panel with these three farmers, but I, uh, I've been working the last year out in Montana at an ag research center out there and did my master's with Dwayne Beck here at, at South Dakota State and, and did my master's research out there at the Coal Lakes Research Farm. And I'll be starting, uh, taking over for, for Dwayne as the, the Coal Lakes Farm Manager here next week. Uh, grew up on a farm and ranch in Martin, South Dakota no-till, diversified crop rotations there, and integrated livestock, and, and so I was always interested in the, in the family farm there, and, and was pretty fortunate to be raised up on, on that, but yeah, that's, that's why they got an unemployed guy up here, so I'm just kind of an outsider. Well, I'm glad you thought you had to take a little bit longer, because I think mine and my up here would be a little bit longer to share a little bit, you know, why I'm where I'm at. Um, so I graduated college in 2016. Um, you know, at that time, I was kind of a disciple of the Hefty Brothers. Um, you know, really was into their balancing their soils through base saturations and getting all your nutrients in line in order to have more water holding capacity and more yield. And you know, so I always had that idea that um, you know we needed to make the resource more productive, and instead of going out and buying more land. Um, you know, and, and having to, you know, go out and compete with your neighbors and, and need to get bigger, all that. I just thought, well, we could be better at managing what we do have. And at that time, stewardship, you know, holistic management hadn't even, you know, really wasn't on my radar at all. But um, in the spring of 2018, uh, we had a really bad dust storm. So I'm um, in between Highmore and Miller, um, I guess would be you know, where we're at there on Highway 14 would be south of Highway 14, Reheights, 10 miles. And at that time, you know, there was um, three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you know, it looked like there was a big thunderstorm coming in, but once it hit, it was, um, you know, just completely black out. You know, you couldn't see six foot in front of you. And so, you know, the next day when, uh, you know, the sun came back out, we went and, you know, to look at the damage. and. You know, there was just soybean fields that all been sandblasted off and um you know so at that time we started to replant all that ground and man that was that was really an eye-opener for me that uh we you know that the resource is capable of you know taking that kind of damage and still producing a crop you know i in my mind i didn't think i thought that was the end i'm like man i'm seeing rocks on this ground that i've never seen before I just thought if it could take it one time, you know, this one time, and I knew it wasn't the first time, but my first observation of it, I never want to see it again on, on the land that I'm managing. And so I reached out to the Soil Health Coalition and Cindy Zink, and she put me in contact with, um, with Dan Forgey 
to kind of start understanding soil health, health principles. And then by the grace of God, and we went from a severe drought in the spring of 18, and then by July, I think, gosh, that year in July, we got probably 10 inches of rain. And there was a severe thunderstorm where we got three and a half inches of rain that night. And we got some hail, and it hailed out an oat field and a wheat field. Um, so it's two different quarters. And I have to plant a cover crop on that, and there was a lot of nutrients there that um, the oats and the, and the wheat hadn't used up, so we planted a full season cover crop on that. And that was my first year getting into it. And then in 19, we had 1,300 acres of prevent plant. Um, so I had to plant diverse cover crops on that. And then 20, we had another 1,000 acres of prevent plant. Um, so I got a lot of experience at planting cover crops. Um, and then this spring, I ended up that I moved to my father-in-law's place in order to um, really start the regenerative holistic movement. I'm doing a lot of things similar to what Cooper is with the 10 month weeding, weeding in March, keeping the, that cap on the cow. Um, you know, they haven't been vaccinated at all or anything. I had to treat five calves um, this fall with a little bit of pneumonia. Um, they've been healthy throughout the winter now and stuff. Um, I, my father-in-law's got about 500 acres of hay ground and 500 acres of crop ground. That all got planted to cover crops this summer. Got grazed in July and a little bit of August. And I got winter grazed here. We just moved the cows home here a few weeks ago off of that. Um, that was about as profitable as he's ever been. Um, they were custom cows that were on that ground getting paid $2.50 a day on a cover crop that had already um, been paid for by the first cattle that went across it. So August rains really helped there. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on. We went from, he went from 10 paddocks to, um, we, I, I've made it into about 75 here this summer. Um, so yeah, just a lot of intense management. Um, not as intense as I'd like to be, but getting there. Um, so yeah, I definitely probably missed some things, try to, um, yeah, maybe something else will come up here, but um, yeah. Well, I'll give you the opportunity to answer this first question. What, uh, maybe describe one of your biggest challenges each of you had in your soil health journey and what you've done to overcome that challenge. I'd say my biggest challenge was peers because um, it was really new to my area. You know, every, there's a lot of successful people in our area that they didn't think that they needed to change it. You know, they still don't believe, you know, they're successful the way that they've been doing it. Their, you know, their dads have been doing it. And so when I kind of caught this bug, I wanted to tell everybody about it. You know, I was like, man, this, this is, you know, we need to be stewards and we need to take care of this resource and we can make our ground, you know, hold more water and, and you know, be more viable. And I found out in a matter of about three months that nobody wanted to talk to me anymore. So, um, yeah, so I've had to tone that down now. Um, you know, that was coming on four years ago now. And so people are starting to approach me again now and realize, okay, we can pick Cody's brain a little bit on it. He's not forcing it on us anymore, you know, so that was probably my biggest challenge. Uh, biggest challenge, and I'm just getting going on, on everything in my career, but I guess probably summer 2021, I would just start with. It was a uh, really dry summer out in Montana and the hottest on record. And I thought it would be a good idea. It's mostly in central Montana, Moccasin, where I was located, mostly wheat and barley country. And 4,300 foot elevation, pretty short growing season. And I wanted to see if we could get some corn to go to green out there, some dry land corn. And really all that's out there for corn right now is irrigated and just for silage. And so I, I tried to get some really short day corn. And so I planted some 69 and 74 day corn this last spring out there in May. Got it in pretty early and then everything shut off, moisture shut off and turned the heat up. And, and it was looking pretty tough by the fall, but we were lucky enough that we had a, a cover crop going right next to it. And so we were able to save face a little bit and, and not make it be quite such a plot by grazing that alongside of our cover crop there. So, but yeah, 2021 was a uh, big challenge, I would say. So this is only year three for me doing this, but I'd have to say the biggest challenge has been <clears throat> communication in our operation. Not only just within the people within our business, 
but communicating with the agronomists of what we're trying to do, communicating with who we're selling our beef to and why we're doing it this way, and trying to form these connections with other people and explaining why we're doing it has been very difficult at times. And then even with the people within our business, you know, we can all be on the same page, but being able to verbally communicate and effectively work with them is kind of challenging sometimes. So for, for me, um, we're very much in our infancy as far as our soil health the journey goes, um, making the transition. And when you come to these meetings and workshops, it's, it's easy to get very overwhelmed on everything that these pioneers, such as Brian and the other members on the board, are doing. And it, you can kind of lock up and not know where to begin. Um, so the hardest part for me was just forming a game plan on where do we start? And how do we begin making this transition in a, in a way that's as risk adverse as possible? Because um, we all have to make a living doing this. And being involved in a community like the Soil Health Coalition and getting to know these guys up here, they're valuable resources to lean on to make decisions that hopefully aren't going to hurt you. Because they've, they've stumbled in the past and made some problems and you can learn from them. And I feel like I'm already ahead because I'm able to lean on them, on their expertise and stuff to kind of help us hit the ground running on this transition and, and hopefully get into it in a way that is going to be sustainable and we'll be able to build on. So that's, that's been a challenge for me, I guess, is where to begin. Okay, then following up on your challenges, what are your, each of you have a, one or two uh, main goals going forward, say short term and long term for your operation? So I guess what we're starting with short term goals is we're bringing diversity back into our, into our rotations. Um, what, what made that really eye opening for me is we all have a, a dad or a grandpa that said this used to be the most productive land on our farm. And then if you look at it now, it's like, how is that? How, it's hard to wrap your head around, but how was that the most productive in what it's doing now? Um, you know, the mission statement on our farm revolves around stewardship and leaving everything in a better way that we found it. And that's really what started all this. And, and we're bringing diversity back as far as the short term goal to start accomplishing some of those things, knowing the value of that. Um, so that's where we're starting now and trying to, you know, be more dedicated to minimal disturbance and then long term, you know, just that we hopefully have a resilient cropping system that can handle the ebbs and flows that we get with weather here in South Dakota and have a more consistent, sustainable way to do it. Um, that's hopefully what's making that sustainable is being less reliant on, on inputs and, and everything. I think that's the ultimate goal is to just try to elevate what we're doing and make it as consistent as we can. So the last few years have been pretty wet in our area and the salinity problems have gotten out of control. So kind of our number one priority right now is getting them to where we're, they're manageable and we're utilizing the cover crops and the cattle. And that's how we're slowing it down and rebuilding a lot of these riparian areas and um, improving the soil health on them. Long-term goals is pasture improvement and then the overall soil health but we kind of got to stop these big dead spots growing right off the bat because it's taken over a lot of our fields and a lot of our area. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm kind of between jobs right now, but I'll, I'll talk about Dakota Lakes uh, in terms of moving forward there at the research farm. Um, hoping to you know maintain the notoriety and, and prestige that that place holds just uh, at the time being. And, <coughs> And the long-term rotation studies that are in place there, I think, are really key and, and are uh, very, very important for farmers to come see those and, and visualize or visually see and have learned tactility and, and look at the differences between those rotations. And so I think that's a, a key moving forward is to keep those in place and, and progress on top of those. And, some of the work that's being done there on incorporating perennials will start to be, we'll start to see some of that data and, and see what's happening with, with that. So that'll be exciting there as well. Yeah, I guess a short term goal for me, you know, I just moved down to my father-in-law's place this spring in March and um, it, would have, it wasn't probably two weeks after being there, but we had some pretty high wind and one of, he had a 40 acre piece that started blowing and, I guess he had um, 
you know, one of those high speed tillage, tillage tools went across it in 19, I believe, to plant, in order to plant soybeans on it. So then, or maybe it was 20, it would have been, yeah, 20. And then so in, in the spring of 21, it broke loose and started blowing. Um, and as soon as you know, the frost kind of came out of the ground enough and I could get out there and plant it, and I just went across it with some barley and oats, um, just a half rate, you know, and it cost six bucks an acre for the seed, you know, and stuff, and, and just got it stopped, you know, as, as soon as we got a rain and, and trying to get stop that blowing. And so, you know, as a rancher, um, he used his farm ground as, you know, as very extractionary because, you know, he was a cow calf guy that needed a lot of feed for the winter to get his cows through and feed his calves. And um, so a lot of that farm ground was used just for feed. So, um, you know, out of the 500 acres, maybe 100 acres of it, everything wasn't getting exported off of it. So the carbon was lacking big time. So that was part of the reason that this year um, we had to put fence around um, everything. There wasn't any fence around it. Cattle had never been on this ground. Um, so this year we planted cover crops on all of that and, and grazed all the hay ground that had never been grazed either. This was just some kind of low ground that could produce um, hay every every year. And so they just took hay off of it every year, which um, you know worked fine for them. But you know, with, with my understanding, I know that that ground really really needed cattle on it and, and needed to start cycling that nutrients and, and starting to get that soil working again. Um, so that's. I'm going to continue to do that. You know, next year we're going to do the same thing. It'll be a full season cover crop again, and we'll we'll graze cattle across it as much, depending on how much rain we get. Um, it'll just be it'll be cat for you know cattle to graze, and after that we'll see see where we want to go with it. If it'll go back into perennials, or um, or if we'll raise a cash crop on it again, we'll just see. Um, Long term goals, you know, I, I guess I did mention I have my wife and and a um, little daughter that's going to be coming three here this spring and um, a little boy that's nine months old. And so, um, you know, I started catching this bug before before they came along, but, you know, now that I do have that next generation, um, it really makes you realize that, um, you know, taking these steps and, and having a 50-year plan um, is something that's very important to me. So it's just building on the resource, building on the ecosystem, I guess. Any questions from the audience right now? Yes, Dan. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the open spots in your fields, and I'm, are you referring to selenity? <coughs> and it, all you guys, if you have a problem with selenity, how, what do you plan on doing about it? Could you, I mean, not everybody might have problems with it. The people that have problems with selenity, could you kind of address how you're, and Cooper, is that what you were talking about, that open? Could you mm -hmm. address how you're trying to handle that, please? Okay, so for those of us that aren't here in person and but are on, watching online, the question is, uh, how are they addressing the salinity issues that maybe they have on their farm? So I got lucky. I don't, I don't know why I decided to, but um, you know our salinity areas, a lot of them, you know, are kind of on the outsides, you know, the perimeters of fields and stuff. And I was the one running the sprayer when I got home, you know, to my family farm that I just left now the spring, but. I, I ran a sprayer around that place for three years, and I just decided I was going to quit spraying them. You know, it was part of the field that you know, when we used to hire the spraying done, they would just spray it with the rest of the field. Well, um, I just thought, well, heck, why am I wasting spray on that? You know, there's nothing growing out there anyways. And so I quit putting herbicide on it and just leaving it alone. Um, and after about two years, you know, they started being some um, you know, like some barley, you know, some wild barley and, and different things start coming. Um, and, you know, so leaving it alone was the first thing, you know, because you need to get something growing there to start cycling the salt out of it, get the ground covered so it quits evaporating the moisture and bringing more salt to the surface. And um, there's not a lot of things that a guy can plant that are gonna be, um, you know, more salt tolerance than what naturally might already be there. So for me, it was taking the herbicides out of the equation allowing nature kind of to, you know, put something in there that could grow and then um, leaving it alone after that. But now I'm kind of left there, so I don't know, my cousin might be spraying those spots again, I'm not sure. I guess I haven't done or dealt uh, personally with any, any saline soils, but I think long-term perennials we're gonna have to use to some extent to cycle up some of those nutrients that are leaching out of that profile. 
Um, on my family's operation, we're dealing with some sodic soils. And it seems like about all that'll grow in there is kosher. And, but even that, we, we kind of just let that go a little bit and we'll hay that off and pull that off. I mean, we've got some uh, salt tolerance alfalfa planted in there and then some barley as well that we're, we're trying to just pull that off and get those salts uh, removed out of there. But I think long term, we're gonna have to be utilizing some of that, those, those perennials to cycle some of that lime, calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate, like Dwayne was talking about uh, this morning here. And so that's, that's something that we're gonna have to be looking at moving forward here. I know it's starting to be a big problem out in, out in this area, out in Montana, the acidic soils is really uh, getting to be, their, their pH is really dropping low and they're, they're blaming it a lot on their overuse of nitrogen fertilizer, which I think is definitely contributing, but I'm thinking the, the water use intensity of some of their rotations, just a wheat fallow uh, rotation isn't doing quite enough to cycle some of those nutrients back up to the, the surface of the soil there. So that's something that we, we're gonna need to consider. Yeah, so this is last year's when we first started working with the NRCS agent and he came out and we designed a cover crop mix that would handle those saline spots. But where they were really bad, the cover crop didn't grow, but we didn't use any herbicide application. We just said whatever was gonna come, we're gonna let grow. And then once it got <clears throat> probably three to four feet tall, we went out there and lightly grazed it. And then we left it be, came back the following fall, so the beginning of this fall, and then fall grazed it. But our plan is to bale graze on top of it and then leave that residue and follow it up with another cover crop and just let whatever can grow, grow. And we've had pretty good luck. Some years you get timely rains with that bale grazing, and I know we've done it with millet bales before, but if you get the right time rain, um, the millet will just take off or whatever's in that bale will hopefully start growing in those areas, and that's how we're planning on controlling it. But this is only year two, and um, what we've seen so far, though, has been pretty good results. And I got cows that'll eat anything, so I don't care what grows out there, I can handle it. So Dan, our approach that we're taking um, is kind of a, a hybrid of things. Um, in the really bad spots, like right next to a slough, where we know that that water area, that the water is always going to be, we're gonna have to deal with seeps and stuff, we're going to CRP on those areas. Um, getting a buffer strip there to just hold that at bay, knowing that that, that slough, that low ground, is, is just going to be there no matter what we do, so we need, we need to stop that from advancing into the rest of our acres. Now, the, the other acres that have become affected by saline that we feel we are gonna be able to bring back around and have some hope to be back into a crop production system, um, we've gone with the Soil Health and Habitat Program. It's a five-year perennial program. Um, they, cost, they pay for the seed and you get a payment every year for five years. You have the ability to hay it after the nesting season. Um, so. The way we looked at that as an advantage was we could get a perennial going on it that's a mix of alfalfa and grasses and stuff that we would we could plant something on it and not have to manage it as intensely as, as a crop production system. We're going to, our plan is to mow it and hay it a couple of years out of the five, and it's just we, that goes back to the, as risk adverse as we could. Be. We all know what um, a diverse rotation can do but eventually you gotta rotate out and put something there that's maybe not as beneficial as if you have to ro rotate out your small grains or your corn and go back to soybeans. Well, that year of soybeans, we know isn't doing anything for those acres, so let's put something on it for five years that's going to continually have a living right there, go down and get the salts, push them down, use, use the water, and, and then we just, don't, we just don't have to worry about it for a little while. And then our hope is that we have a more robust rotation that when that five year contract's up, we can make the decision on that acre, are we gonna bring this back into our cropping rotation or do we wanna, at the soil health school, we've reached me the same, you know, sometimes you gotta give that acre a different job and maybe it stays in hay production. So we'll have the flexibility to make that decision. Um, and the soil health and habitat program is um, kind of correlated with Kristen Weber, Anthony Bly, um, and Every Acre Counts, they work kind of hand in hand and they do a precision acre analysis and. Brian's talked about this before on some of his different um, speaking stuff that he's done. And the profitability when you're not going across those acres and where your APHs can go, it's a no-brainer. So that's the route we're going. 
So the unique part about all those answers, they all have a little different philosophy, but they're all doing the right thing. And they're all right when you're quit putting inputs on those areas. I'll plant some grasses, use perennials to your advantage, and pull back on some of the soybeans, because we all know what that's going to do to those saline areas. Bale grazing is a great tool. Those are all great options for those of you that have saline areas. And some of the students in here, you know, there's, there's varying techniques that can be done to fix those areas and drastically increase the soil health and the profitability for your operation there. So, another question from the audience. Yes, sir. I have one for Cooper and maybe Cody. Uh, the main June camper myself, have you found over the years, how long have you been doing this? This will be my third year. Okay, so have you found that when I first initially started, you know, it was May 1st, and now it's seemingly I'm moving it even further away, have you found that you actually like starting better when the grass is already green and kicked off? Because May 1st, a lot of the times it's not. So are you waiting until like May 15th, May 20th? And what is your calving window, 45, 60 days or longer? Yeah, so we actually started about the 10th of May. I found it's kind of been the sweet spot. And because we, we can get on some game production land that the Game Fish and Parks has, so we found it's better to kind of wait that extra week in May, let the grass get established, and then we can haul those cows out to the pasture before they even start calving. So they have a little chance to kind of get settled in before they start. And yeah, it definitely pays having at least six to eight inches of green grass on the ground versus starting to calve when the grass is just starting to get going. And we're not as hard as on the grass either. So we've been able to bale graze a little farther into April, kind of the first of May. And a big thing that we've actually been doing is going from bale grazing and then grazing rye off on our cropland. And that's kind of helped fill that little window in there because when the grass starts getting green, the cows don't really want to eat that. You got to have some pretty high quality bales there to keep them occupied. Otherwise they're gonna, they're gonna go find some green grass. But then, then, so when I started, I didn't want to use any, I wanted to go all natural on my cows and I didn't know how many I was gonna have fall out. So I still have a 90 day calving window. I know it's way longer, but I just didn't know if I was gonna have a bunch of open cows if I could afford to have that. So I gave them a second opportunity just because if a calf's born on grass, he isn't that much smaller being August 1st versus June 1st. There wasn't that big of a gap. I can manage that. So I got a, I got a follow up to that part then. So if you found last year, we're in Brookings County, so last year doing this, you know, June was incredibly hot for, I mean, well above the average. I mean, June probably, you know, should be in your high 70s, low 80s. I mean, we had 100 degree, 100 degree day. Do you have good shade or do you have, have your cattle become more heat tolerant? Because we had a few calves, luckily they were fine, but you know, they do get heat stress when they're born that young into 100 degree weather per se. So where we're calving is we got a lot of cover and residue, but usually by June when it gets hot, I already have at least a foot to two feet tall green grass. So as I'm moving my cows, my cats kind of have learned that I'll graze it down almost to the ground or leave about four or five inches. So there's not really much for them to bed into. They'll go on to the next paddock. Yep. And then when I roll that fence up, all the cows got to do is go in there, start grazing, and they usually find their calves right away. I was tagging um, last year, tagging my first calf, and he got up and ran through the fence and went to the neighbors. So I quit tagging, and I actually don't do that until we pull them out of that pasture and we go to haul them, split the cows from calves. Then I just put a uh, tag in the calf's ear. If I want to know whose mother that is, then I can find him later on in the summer if he's worth keeping as a bull prospect or a heifer prospect. But yeah, those calves, they're pretty smart and they go on to the next paddock and they find, and that grass, I mean, it's cool when you got two feet tall green grass. So that hasn't been an issue. But I can see where if you got some shorter grass, right. that's when you're gonna run into trouble. So then, so then with your, your follow-up to, to that, Cody could add in on this too. I was curious, do you have, do you find that when you made the switch right away, this is, this is the sixth year for our operation, but I know the following year we did have some fallout just because the time you're breeding in August, the, a lot of the grass that per se is not as good as it is in May and June and things like that, your nutrient is higher. And I know like Burke Tyson, some of those guys, they recommend when you're making the transition, 
So we'll either put them on grass that we haven't grazed too hard so it's full of nutrients, or we that's when we go on to like a full season cover crop, and that kind of helps fill that void. If we can plan somewhere along the lines of that, and that definitely helps with the breeding. And luckily, um, by the grace of God, I haven't had any disasters, but I'm just kind of by the, flying by the seat of my pants on it. Cody said he covered it, so any other questions? Yes, sir. You talk about, uh, like, if you guys are utilizing NRCS equip and then you'll, like, uh, fencing, like, are you guys getting top tier for that? You know, how can uh, younger producers utilize some of these opportunities? Okay, so the question is, uh, what, what programs and uh, assistance are you guys maybe utilizing on your operation to help you move forward? Yeah, good question, because that's obviously a huge part of this management. It does take a fair amount of infrastructure. Um, I got lucky and, and ended up, um, you know, working with, I guess, Ducks Unlimited, and um, we and I just kind of came to them with a little bit of a plan, and, and we worked together. Um, you know, coming down there, we put up about 20 miles of fence here this summer, um, and about 6,000 um, feet of water line. We're going to do a lot more water here this next summer. I kind of did the fencing before the water and, and had a portable water setup that I was pumping out of dugouts and stuff um, with portable portable uh, tanks. Everything I have is, is portable because I'm moving the water with the cattle. I'm pulling um, the you know, pipe with, you know, whenever they move, the water's going with them. I don't want them traveling very far for water. Um, you know, just, and then also for the, the disturbance and the manure distribution, wherever the water is at is where you're, you can really control where the cattle are going to be at, um, which is kind of, a, I guess, a grazing management tool. Um, but yeah, with, with Ducks Unlimited, we, you know, had a 50% cost share on all this, and we would have never been able to do everything that we did this year without them. And I know that NRCS and, um, you know, Game and Fish, you know, there's a lot of places that, that offer the same deal. We just ended up, um, you know, working. I found somebody that I really like. Um, things went really well with her, and so that's that's what we went through, I guess. So. I'll just pass that on. We don't really utilize those at research farms, so I'll pass it on to the real farmers here. <laughs> so we never did the Ducks Unlimited, but we found uh, we got equip contracts and CIS contracts. This will be the second year at the CIS, but they're pretty much the same and go hand in hand. They're both trying to do the same thing on the crop ground, um, planting full season cover crops, getting the handle on the saline areas, and then on the pasture with the equip, it's water development, and they cost share most of the well and the water infrastructure. They won't do any perimeter fencing, like on the crop ground, I think they might on the pasture, but they will do the portable fencing on the inside, and we've utilized that because it is a big chunk to, to purchase especially when you start looking at how expensive things are going up. But uh, yeah, we use Equip and CIS has been the big ones for us. Yeah, good question, Tom, because it's, it's important. Um, the way we've kind of approached it being we don't have the live livestock component is the routes we're going and the different programs, we wanted to try to be able to make it work without the program first. And then hopefully we can get into the program that's just, just gonna make it that much better of a deal for us because we know our long-term goals are going to remain the same regardless of if we're in a program or not. So we try to do everything we could to make make the the direction we're going work. Um, now some of the programs that we have gotten into are the soil health and habitat program, um, as I said, and uh, CRP. Um, we're in the midst of applying for CSP and EQIP, similar to what these guys have done, and trying to you know. These practices can generate some dollars, and some people will pay you to do them, not only the government, but other things. And I know the Soil Health Coalition has a cover crop grant. It's a different thing. So if you're willing to do the research and put in the time to fill out the applications and get to know the right people, there's excellent resources at the NRCS to help guide you um, to down what path or what programs you want to do that to help you reach your goals. So those are the places we've come. So I think we're about out of time. Uh, so we'll just maybe finish up here. What uh, one thing that you would say to uh, encourage other producers going forward? So we're going to Shane Jordan at the NRCS. Um, there's a quote that he told me that really stuck with me, and is if you want to make small changes, 
change the way you do things. And if you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. And it all starts with that mindset shift. And that's, that's ultimately where we're at as an operation right now is we're looking at things differently and that in turn gives you directions to go after the goals that you want to achieve. And ultimately, you just gotta start somewhere. You can't do it all at once and try to minimize the risk where you can, but start somewhere and know that you're working towards the long-term goal at hand and that's maintaining the resource that you operate on for not only you as an operator, but hopefully the next generations to come. I would say never stop coming to things like these. I mean, the people you meet at these conferences and the networks that you build, those are the relationships that are really going to help pull our operation through. And it seems like every time you go to one, even though if you know the oper or know what they're going to be talking about, you can always take away something that you never thought about before. And you can even hear the same information two, three times, but sometimes it just doesn't click until you hear it the fourth or fifth time. But just never stop meeting people and. Uh, that's the biggest resource, I think, is the people. Uh, something to encourage. I, I'm pretty pessimistic, so I, I don't know, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, I think, you know, coming from the perspective of some younger producers here, um, and we're seeing, you know, the changes that have been made over the past few decades, and, and stepping into operations at our age versus what the previous uh, generation stepped into, and and I don't know if this goes across the board, but I, I think we see that these practices are working and, and that these principles are working and, and we're maybe stepping into some, some better situations than other guys were, were stepping into. So uh, fortunate in that way, but yeah, I, I would say it's, it's working. Yeah, for sure. Just to add on that, um, I guess Alan Williams, he would be a part of Understanding Ag. He, he puts it, you know, as compounding positive or negative effects on the landscape, and you know that really is kind of goes into every decision that I make. Um, is this is this making a positive effect, or, or am I taking a step backwards? Because if you can continue that ball, you know, rolling in a positive direction, and continue, you know, your decision making, and you know the, the you know the management that you have on the land to all be positive, and you never really do stub your toe. Just imagine, you know, how big that ball can get. You know, it's like compounding interest. You continue to make the right decisions, and it just becomes easier and more profitable. You know, kind of the beginning stages when that ball is small. You know, that's when it's the hardest. So, um, you know, when you're trying to start that little ball rolling, like Cooper said, um, these type of events. You know, YouTube. Everybody has you know, podcasts now. I, you know, when I got, you know, kind of got into this. I spent, you know, hundreds of hours, you know, listening to, because I was still feeding cattle for three, four hours a day at that point, so I got a lot of time in the tractor. Um, yeah, I was listening to books, podcasts, you know, reading a lot. Um, you know, in a matter of a year, I, I can't even imagine how long it would have taken somebody to learn what I learned in a year, you know, 40 years ago. You know, it probably would have been a 10 or 15 year process to try to get books together and, and try to understand what am I trying to do here? And, you know, nowadays you can just find, you can search, and you can find out uh, an answer to your question pretty quickly, and you can find pioneers that have already done it and made mistakes um, that can make your, your transition and, and your decisions a lot easier to do. So.